Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. to Nightlight. Thank you for sharing your time with us. We truly appreciate the attention you give us and hope that you are as enriched and enlightened and, er and entertained by the people that we bring to share with you as we are to have them with us. I want to thank Ken Quiethawk for his m amazing intro. You can find him at um, nativestorytellers.com and he and his wife have an amazing site there. Please check it out. It is a profound um, pleasure to, to learn history the way that the Native Americans or the first, first families or whatever they are called these days, how they preserve their history and, and far more, I think, accurate than a lot of our textbooks are today. But that's another story for sure. Tonight we have a special guest as, as far as I'm concerned because um, he has brought forward some material that, that I have been fascinated with for a long time, and I had the honor of reading his book and getting further entranced and educated uh, by the whole incident. It's one that I think probably a lot of you have heard about. Uh, <clears throat> I know that in the um, intro to the show I mentioned UFOs, um, and indeed we're going to be talking about them, but but not in little green men and ancient and aliens it's we're going to be talking about unidentified flying objects and and there's a difference <clears throat> excuse me i have as my guest tonight i'm honored to have as my guest tonight james w peniston us army air force sorry us air force retired he's the author of the rendlesham enigma he and his team were the first responders to a security investigation of a craft of unknown origin located just outside RAF Woodbridge, England in December of 1980. The Rendlesham Forest incident of that year is considered by far the most significant event in UFO history. It was also a unique military-related event having taken place in Rendlesham Forest, just outside the twin bases of RAF Brentwaters and RAF Woodbridge in Suffolk, England, both of which had been transferred to the United States Air Force in 1951 by the British Ministry of Defense, becoming one of the largest and most important NATO complexes in Europe during the Cold War. The account given in this book is that of James W. Penniston, a staff sergeant at the time, of the incident, who was the primary witness who led the investigation in the beginning and had the <clears throat> excuse me and had top secret clearance, one of only eight people with top secret clearance working security at the twin bases. His credibility and honesty were highly respected throughout his years in the U.S. Air Force. He has teamed up with co-author. Gary Osborne to present the definitive account of Rendlesham incident and the aftermath of events just as he witnessed and experienced them from the incident itself which began in the early morning hours of Boxing Day, December 26, 1980 
up to April 2014. The book is amazing. It gives um, a day-to-day explanation of what he went through. And because he was in the military, uh, his experience were far more intense than than those of us who have seen a UFO and just been teased. Um, If you want to research this a little bit more, you can go to www.therendlesham-forest-incident.com. And if you want to see him up front and in person, he's going to be appearing at Starworks at the Starworks USA conference at Laughlin, Nevada, November 1st through 3rd. And once you've read this book, once you've looked at it, once you've been experienced the day experiencing the day to day, the hour by hour experience, you will find that um, there is far more going on with this event, especially because it was a military um, base. And it, it's, it's fascinating to see what he went through and over the years the things that he has experienced. And, and eventually the material that he wrote down and shared that, that has, I think, an amazing foretelling of the future. So without further ado... Jim, thank you very much for being on Nightlight. I'm I'm so honored that you are here tonight to share your story with us. Well, thank you so much for having me on. You know, uh, uh, Paula Harris got me so excited about doing this show. Uh, And I says, I will do it. I will do it. Uh, She (laughs) says, no, she does great shows. And I'll tell you what, (laughs) that is the best introduction I've ever had on a radio show. Thank you. Oh, well, I'll send you a clip. You can use it. You can just give it to other hosts, and they can just take it from there. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> well, you know, um, your story is is heartwarming, and because you you probably didn't even think about UFOs and stuff at the time, I think that, that your book relates how you you proceeded with the entire incident. And because you're military and trained, yeah, you know, most people see UFOs and you know, yeah, over breakfast the next day or something, will say, "Oh, I saw a UFO." But you documented it to the to the to an extreme, which I think is is phenomenal. And you you kept your documentation so that so that it's it's it just makes the whole incident so much more profoundly um, true. I, I think that that. Um, it, it was amazing when I was reading through it to realize, you know, just just how how much you had documented. And 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 actually, I have to, you know, certainly, um, I, I'm impressed by your memory because you know, that's, it's almost 40 years now, and and um, the material is just amazing. Well, my memory is probably not that good. I think it's average. But uh, you know, there's some things I did that were just different. I had the real time notes. Uh, mm-hmm. That I was taking, but I also uh, I had a sergeant one time tell me uh, uh, in the Air Force you always got a CYA. And I said okay, how do I do that? He says keep a daily journal while you're in the Air Force. I said okay, mm-hmm. so I kept journals for 20 plus years, and so when I got ready to write the book, uh, uh, the aftermath was a lot easier than it sounded because it was uh, documented. Well, it's just for those who have not seen a UFO. Well, you didn't know it was a UFO. Let's let's go back I, to. I've never that, seen that, a UFO. That's the thing. Yeah. I've never seen one. Well, <laughs> let's, let's go. Well, you you experienced something there for sure. Um, so let's go back to that evening and and sort of walk us through what occurred, and then we'll, we'll take it from there because I think the story it, it becomes. Um, the foundation for an amazing story. So what happened that evening? Well, just to give you a little bit overlay about the bases, uh, the uh, RAF Bentwaters is the main operating base, and then that's where our command centers were and control centers and all that stuff. And then Woodbridge had a couple squadrons of A-10s on it. that were separated by three uh, miles as a uh, crow would fly. Uh, but it, it fell on the operational control of Bentwaters. 
I know that sounds trivial, but together uh, there with dependents, Air Force dependents, and active duty, we had over 10,000 people at those swim bases. Uh, and it was on the uh, uh, northeast of London, about 60 miles, sitting on the coast of Suffolk. It was, uh, they had a wartime mission. We had a, a time with terrorism going on, different type of terrorism. I mean, it was like the Bader Meinhof, uh, the Black September, the IRA, all, 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 all those kind of groups. Uh, so there was a lot, a, lot of, a lot of stuff. And it was the height of the Cold War. But uh, the, that night uh, started uh, uh, fairly uh, routine. Uh, like most nights, uh, we were working 12-hour shifts. Security was because it was, uh, you know, the Christmas uh, uh, season. And law enforcement, which is separate, they were working an eight-hour shift. And uh, uh, so I had done. I started my shift uh, uh, on the 25th, uh, and, you know, I was doing regular things like lighting checks and stuff like that. I was the supervisor for uh, Woodbridge Base for security. And so I met, uh, I, was, I talked to the security response team leader, Sergeant McCulley. I said, he says, Hey, let's, let's meet for breakfast. You know, we're going to have a breakfast around midnight. And, um, I said, okay. So I get to the chow hall and I'm getting ready to sit down for breakfast. And, uh, uh, McCulley says to me, he says, uh, do you hear the radio call for you? And I said, no. And he says, they want you to call. And we had a direct line from the, from the, the chow hall there to the Central Security Control. And I remember I called him, and it was Sergeant Coffee, and I said, uh, what's going on? He says, I need you to respond to the East Gate. Uh, he says, we have a situation out there. I said, okay, what is it? He says, the law enforcement patrolman will brief you when you get there. He says, but run code two. And code two is with lights on. And I said, uh, okay. Which is really odd, because anytime we're going to do an emergency response, I usually know what's going on before I get there. Um, anyway, it takes about, uh, this is about 12.03 at night, 12.04. I'm going to give you everything in civilian time, okay? And um, so I respond. I get there around 12.04, 12.05, something like that. I contact Sergeant uh, uh, Stephens. He's a, a senior uh, law enforcement guy. And I said, what's going on, bud? That's his first name, bud. And he, he points over the Reynolds from Forest area adjacent to East Gate. And um, I could see, a can, you know, over the canopy of the forest, I could see like a, a bubble of white light. And, uh, and then I could see multiple color lights in the forest. And I'm trying to figure out what, what it is. Uh, I says, uh, hmm, it sort, of, it sort of looked like an aircraft crash. And I, at that point in time, I'd probably been to, I don't know, 20, 22, 23. I don't know how many credit, a lot of them. And, yeah. uh, but it wasn't exactly right. And I said, well, but I said, did you, did you hear it uh, crash or you see it crash? He said, it didn't crash. He said, it landed. And I said, I'm thinking to myself, that's impossible. Um, the trees were only like four, they're like five or six feet apart. They were, they were really, you couldn't land in them. And so we debated it. In fact, I was trying to convince them that something crashed rather than land. And so I go over to the uh, direct line at the East Gate, and I contact Central Security Control, my control center. Uh, and, and when we do this, there's like five people online immediately. And uh, they're all got their little things they got to do. And uh, so I'm talking to the shift commander mainly, uh, Lieutenant Brand and Sergeant Chandler, the flight sergeant. And um, so I was telling my observations. And uh, then Sergeant Coffey comes back around, and he had already checked with uh, London radar, uh, Eastern radar, and Bentwater's radar. And apparently about 15 minutes before that, they lost contact with a bogey, a unidentified uh, radar blip uh, about 15 minutes prior over Woodbridge Base. So that confirmed an emergency situation of a possible aircraft downing. And at the time, we had status of forces agreement, these agreements that we have between the British uh, government and the United States on what we can do off base. And uh, 
you have one is we have to have an emergency uh, situation before we can deploy uh, because it is a sovereign country in that. And uh, one of the other uh, caveats they have is uh, unless it's a hostile situation, uh, we don't deploy off base with, ba- with our weapons, you know, machine guns and stuff. Yeah. And uh, so I got everything together. I assembled the team. Um, we have a crash kit that's inside the my vehicle I had already. Um, we did have a lot of aircraft crashes. <laughs> to have the, <laughs> you know, I mean, stuff just happened like that. It's a lot of a lot of flying. Um, anyway, uh, I, out of that, I get uh, stuff I th- I'm going to need. I need to set up an entry control point, you know, down there for first responders and things like that. And um, so I got the plotting board. Uh, I pull, oh, I think the binoculars out. Uh, also, we had a camera in there. And the camera wasn't, uh, it was, could be used for, you know, aircraft crashes, you know, to take pictures of it uh, initially, or even terrorism. If we were seeing something off base, we could take pictures of, you know, something suspicious off base. Uh-huh. So I grabbed that stuff, and we drove out there as far as we could go. This area, Rendlesham, is now then and now owned by the Forestry Commission. And what they do in England is that they use trees as a crop. Like every 10 years, they'll cut them down. I have no idea what they do with the wood. Uh, but they'll, they just plant and then replant them. And so mm-hmm. we're driving across uh, maybe a two, 100 meters, 100 feet, or excuse me, 100 uh, yards of uh, open field, but it's, it's, uh, it's hilly because there's berms of earth where these trees were once planted. They had been cut. And so I went as far as I could, and that's where we're going to go ahead and set up the entry control point. So I leave Erwin Kabanzak there. And at that point, I was having problems uh, with communications on our radios, uh, which is impossible because we have a repeating system all over, all over the Twin Bases. There's no way you can have a, a radio problem, but we did. And so I told Kabanzak that I wanted him to work as a relay with Sergeant Chandler, who was en route to the East Gate to take over for my spot. And uh, that way they were going to maintain communications. And so myself and the other patrolman, another law enforcement patrolman, um, we started on foot toward the tree line. And what I was observing at that point was... uh, uh, not not so much colored lights in the in the forest, but more of a white bluish type light. And you could still see over the canopy of the forest. You could still see um, uh, the area that was lit up over it. Now this forest is extremely thick. I mean, you cannot be out there without flashlights and nothing. It's just total darkness. And uh, as we approach the uh, tree line. Uh, um, you know, I had been started taking all the pictures I could because it was odd. Uh, I had implemented a security pl- uh, the security response option that I was doing, our protocol, uh, was for a downed aircraft. So I'm running this checklist through my head. And um, But as I got closer to the tree line, uh, it was becoming obvious this, this is not an aircraft crash. It didn't have the indicators of... Of, of a crash it didn't first of all it didn't have any noise i didn't hear no uh uh like fire burning stuff i didn't uh, smell anything like uh like fuel that was being burnt or stuff like that uh so we get to the forest edge and um uh we start feeling you know um uh physical effects like uh, uh, static electricity on my skin, my, you know, my hair, my clothing. Uh-huh. And um, so I got Caban's like about 50 to 75 feet behind me. I got the other airmen uh, uh, probably uh, 20, 25 feet to my back right. And so as I enter the forest, there's a big explosion of white light i mean uh it was i thought it was an explosion and so i hit the ground and 
then uh, there was no sound with it, so it wasn't an explosion. And I sort of gained my uh, wits about me then, and I said, uh, okay, that's good. Okay, I'm still alive. Nothing happened that was going to kill me. And um, as I got up, the, the that white light was starting to dissipate, and it was behind the berm a little bit, the berm of uh, earth. And uh, so as I started walking closer to it, uh, I felt more physical effects. One is I couldn't hear my feet uh, walking on the forest floor, like the breaking of branches, you know, and debris. Uh, I couldn't hear uh, no n- none of the forest noise, like wind going through the trees or anything like that. It was complete silence, and uh, which was odd. And uh, then I felt my movements being more labored. Uh, and I describe it, the best way I can describe it is like if you're walking through a pool of water that was waist high, uh, mm-hmm. that would be the feeling that you'd have walking. So I terminate at that point in time uh, the uh, security response option for a downed aircraft. And I implemented a security response option called a helping hand. And what that is is a uh, 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 telephonic uh, up-channel report by radio, which I did call in the radio, um, of a possible hostile threat to the uh, resources on the base, Uh, at least until I can determine otherwise. Uh, And the other thing at that point in time when I implemented that, neither one of us were armed. (laughs) We originally (laughs) went, yeah, I mean, so pretty much we're just going to be, we're going to be able to, you know, sound the alarm and that's about it, you know. Uh, Uh So as I started moving toward the top of the berm, the light's dissipating all the way down. I'm starting to be able to walk a little bit better. It's not as labored. and, of course, I've shot all the film. I have no more film left in my camera. Um, and so I am I come up over the berm, and that light is dissipating to the point where a craft starts appearing that is black and triangular in shape. Uh, totally freaked out, I am. <laughs> I, I had so many emotions going through my head, I don't know if uh, uh, I can really explain that. I try in the book. And, uh, but, well, you, but your your training took over, which I think is fabulous. The training is the only thing that kept me grounded. Okay, um, mm-hmm. I don't know. Uh, I was pretty. I was. It was a. I, it was a very um, scary at times, uh, and then it was. Uh, uh, then then this, then and then seconds later, I'm in awe. You know, I don't. I don't know how to explain it. Um, Anyway, as as this light dissipates, it just leaves this black triangular craft that has multiple colored globular lighting running through it. And there's white light coming out from underneath the craft. And like I said, the forest is completely dark, and you need flashlights or whatever, you know, to see out there. But I didn't need anything. Uh, I could I could see the craft perfectly, uh, perfectly. anyway. Uh, they had enough... Well, that's one of the things I did do. I uh, uh, when it when it when it seemed inert. I mean, uh, when the the globular light stopped moving through it, I felt more at ease, and uh, I still wasn't sure if I was going to survive this incident because at that point in time, I'm inside what I call a sphere of influence. It's about the 15 feet that's running around this this craft, and it's mm-hmm. like a bubble. Uh, that's why I call it a bubble. And, and I can see on the outside of this bubble, I can see the other patrolman just standing there immobilized. And I still don't have any sound going on. And so I'm still alive. So I said, well, I better start recording as much information as I can uh, so the command people can have information. If I don't survive this, at least they have my notes. Uh, and they'll be able to make some decisions, you know. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So I didn't have, like, you know, tape measures or anything like that. So I had to use 
like my I, my stride, I I paced it off, and it it came out. It was like the craft was nine feet uh, long on each side uh, of the triangle. Um, it uh, was. Uh, Oh, I'm six foot two, so it was about six and a half, seven feet tall. It was a little hard to tell with the, because it was sitting inside the, uh, between two berms in mm-hmm. the clearing there. And uh, so I'm starting, I'm going to do, I'm going to do a 360. I'm going to go ahead and examine the craft. I'm going to write down as much as I can. So I get the measurements. Uh, I had a, also a, like a dorsal uh that was going uh, above the craft. I mean, from extended out upwards, like toward the rear, I guess the rear. Uh, and uh, anyway, that was about seven and a half feet up. And so I started uh, looking for all the things that would identify this as an aircraft. Um, things like uh, flaps, um, uh, aerions, uh, uh a crew compartment, intakes, exhaust, I mean, all those things. It had none. It had none of those things. It was void of it. And so the, with the light underneath the craft, I look underneath it. I was wondering how it was fixed above, you know, the, the ground there. And mm-hmm. uh, it was about waist high. And uh, so I'm looking, all I can see this light going down, but then I see indentions in the ground. Uh, so... <laughs> It was a technology I clearly did not understand. Uh, When I'm using the term light, that's my term. Uh, It definitely wasn't light. Like It had to be a technology I did not understand. It it supported the craft. And so I even tried to move it. You know, like even if you had a car out there and you pushed on it, the the car would move an inch or a half inch or something like that. This Mm -hmm. was completely solid, did not move. So I start doing a 360 walk around of it and, um, you know, to, to further inspect, you know, inspect it and write down what I can. And at this point in time, the, the craft is completely inert. I mean, there's no activity going on except for the light underneath it. And I do the first walk around and I start seeing that there's writing on it, which actually was a relieving moment for me because mm-hmm. I figured, okay, I'm going to say, uh, I don't know, NASA, it's going to say U.S. Air Force, it's going to have a, it's Russian, something, Soviet, anything. Uh, Because, uh, and if it was, it was really high tech. But as I get closer to it, and I'm running my hands uh, across the the craft, it's completely smooth. It's a metal of some kind, but it's completely smooth. It doesn't have riveting or nothing like that. And it has... (coughs) uh, Instead of writing, it was more like uh, petroglyphs on the side of it uh, that were etched inside of the craft. And they measured about, oh, three, four feet uh, wide, and then it had a larger one on top with a triangle and a circle. And as I ran my hands across from the smoothness of the craft to the uh, these glyphs, uh, I could – it the, the – the best way to describe it would be like going from smooth glass feeling to like sandpaper. That's when I got to the gloss, and which was odd. Everything was odd. Everything was odd. I had thousands of things that was odd out of it. I mean, um, so I continue walking back around, and so I wrote in my notebook. I, I copied down the gloss and all that stuff. One second, I'm going to grab a little bit of water here. Sure. So I start my my second 360 around. So right now, nothing happened uh, outside that would be dangerous to me. I mean, it was pretty much, uh, I thought it was pretty benign. Uh, as I, And I thought I had a lot of time because no, there's no activity going on. Mm-hmm. Um and in the meantime, while I'm doing this, even though I wasn't receiving central security control on my radio, I still transmitted, and you know, with the um, hopes of either Sergeant Chandler at the East Gate or Kabanzak or central security control would hear me. Who was the other and airman I'm, that was there? Uh, that's Airman Burroughs. Um, okay. Uh, he was law enforcement. Not, he wasn't security. He was law enforcement. 
uh, Kabanzak was secured. There's a big difference in the uh, career fields, okay? Uh, oh, yeah. The law enforcement, yeah, the law enforcement are like gate guards, and they go to domestic stuff like police would. And we mm-hmm. did uh, security to protection of Part A, B, and C re- resources. The operations of the base protected those resources and the base itself. And so there's, it's a completely different construct altogether. Uh, I think today in the Air Force, I think they combined the career fields now into they call it the uh, security forces now. Mm-hmm. Uh, but back then it was uh, uh, security police and then, of course, law enforcement. Um, where are we at? Uh, you're going around and you have lots of time. Mm-hmm. Got the glyph. Yeah, so you know, I, I'm doing my my security checks and saying you know I'm okay, and um, then as I do the the other uh, walk around, I get back around and it's those glyphs. Uh, I I tried to figure it out. I tell you, maybe the closest thing I thought at that time, maybe it was like Egyptian or something like that, or. But it wasn't really, you know, it was, I, I couldn't uh, decipher what it was. And so I'm running my hands back across it, and then that large triangle, which was above the other ones, you know, I says, well, I said, that is, uh, that is, that is really interesting. So I put my hand on that, and immediately when I touched it, there's a brilliant white light. I mean, I cannot see nothing else but this white light. And uh, no sound or nothing like that. But then I'm seeing nothing but flashes of ones and zeros. Really crazy stuff. Uh, and and I don't know how long I had my hand on it, but I gained my senses again. And I just lifted my hand off, and it was completely gone, the light. And I'm using the term light again. And it's not light. It's a technology I don't understand. Because and I know this for a fact, because uh, uh, in that type of situation at night, uh, if you had that kind of bright light night, I mean it was brighter than like flash bulbs. I mean it was really bright. My night vision would have been just uh, my night vision would have took forty minutes, forty five minutes to regain it, and I had no problem with my night vision. I could see everything with no problem, uh-huh. and uh, so. That I made that decision at the time. The last thing I was going to do is touch that craft again. I didn't touch it after that uh, because of what happened. Uh, and, and as I finished, yeah, and as I finished walking around, then I see all of a sudden the, the colored lights start moving around, and showing up again in, in the skin of the craft, the exterior of it. And then the bottom light starts getting wetter. So I get. I back away about 10, 15 feet, and I get down on the ground and I eat dirt. I mean, I'm trying to dig a hole, pretty much, because <laughs> I thought I, I did. I thought I activated something uh, on the craft. Maybe it was going to explode or, or something like that. And uh, I mean, these are all the things that are running through my head. Sure. And and so then when it started to generate. Um, this white light, the coloring, I couldn't see no It was starting to get like when I first seen it. It was starting to become a just a huge ball of white, bluish type light. Um, and but I could still see the remnants of the craft in it, but there was no explosion on. But it got up and it moved uh, away from me about ten or fifteen feet. Now remember, I said those forest trees are planted, you know, five or six feet apart. I paced yeah. it off. I know. I know it's nine feet wide. I know it can't get through there, and uh, it moved back through the trees, maybe about twenty feet. Then it rose up to the uh, uh, tree top level above the trees of so the canopy of the forest. And uh, when it's doing all this, there is no air displacement. There is no sound. Uh, stuff the aircraft would need to do and when it got to the canopy it just made a slight turn and it was gone in a blink of an eye Uh, at that point in time all of a sudden I could hear (laughs) I can hear 
Yeah, I hear, I hear the law enforcement airman Burroughs. Uh, yeah. He runs up next to me, and he I can you know, and then he's he's trying to re uh, acquire the the craft because he's pointing. He says, "Oh, there it is," and he takes off. <laughs> we <laughs> we got a two man we got a two man concept. We have a two, it's our team concept. You never leave the other guy. Okay. Yeah. Never. That's just the rule. At least security would never leave the other guy. And so he took off. So to maintain the concept of the two man uh, integrity, I take off after him, and he's moving pretty fast. We jump over two fences. Uh, he's, uh, at that time, uh, there was a one was a, uh, uh, a barbed wire one. The other one was more of a uh, chicken wire type. And uh, then we're in a farmer's field, and I'm I'm still chasing them, and uh, it's uh, I must have fell down I don't know two or three times and in the farmer's field. It must have been like the, the there was water, you know, and there's, it was pretty cold out, but it was like uh, you know water with a little bit of ice on it type thing, and so I was pretty soaked then after falling down trying to keep up with them, and we finally get to a uh, past these farmhouses in, in, and to the next field, he stops. And uh, thank God. Uh, yeah. I was young. You know, I was 26, but, you know, uh, it was it was a hike. I was pretty exhausted. And um, he stops. And I says, what are you chasing? And he says, I'm chasing that UFO. And I said, what UFO? And he points over in the opposite direction toward the for the coastline. He says, that there. So I had to look down his arm. At it. You know, he's pointing. And he's, I said, what is it? And there's a little, there's a little light on the, on the, uh, on the uh, horizon. He says, that there. I said, that's not, that's not what we've seen. <laughs> I said, that's the lighthouse. Because we had went far enough there that the lighthouse had a, uh, uh, some type of blocking device on it so it wouldn't shine uh, into the interior of the land. Uh-huh. It would only, yeah, so it would only shine out. But we had got far enough where it was visible at that point. And so while he's trying to make the lighthouse into a UFO, I reacquire it over Cable Green, the forest over Cable Green ahead of us. I see it again. It's just hovering there over the canopy. And before I can even say, let's, let's pursue this, you know, a little bit farther, the, the craft just turns and it takes off over the, uh, uh, toward the coast uh, and then out of sight. Uh, at that point in time, I, I could hear um, radio traffic uh, from the control center uh, they're trying to been trying to get hold of us. Uh, I I acknowledge and they says come on back into the east gate. I said we will. So we went back in, you know, and met up with the other security forces at the east gate. That wow. is the incident. I know. Now, uh, <clears throat> now, how long did you think you had spent doing it, and how long did you actually spend doing it? Because. There seems to be a time displacement here somehow. Yeah, I didn't realize until I got back. You know, I'm doing all my notes, you know, for the 1569, the incident complaint report. That's a long version of the blotter entries. And yeah. So I get back to the CSC, and Sergeant Coffey, bless him, he heard everything on the radio because he did the uh, the incident complaint, complaint report. He says, just read it. He says, you don't have to do one. And so I read it, and, yeah, I said, okay, it, this is right. So... Uh, I didn't have to do that report, but then with the clocks in CSC, they got uh, had several of them. Uh, and my watch on my, that I had my uh, arm did not match. I had an electronic at the time, and it was pretty uh, high tech, you know, the electronic ones, you know, battery operated. Yeah. That was like new, and uh, it was off by 45 minutes, it, and it made sense to me that. Time that the, the the watch would stop because there was that electrical uh, static I was feeling. And I said maybe that you know interfered. Uh-huh. So I really don't know how long I was there. According to the CSC, 
it matched. That was that. This was uh, maybe forty five minutes or an hour out there, but it sure didn't seem that long. It only seemed like five minutes. Okay, yeah. it did. <laughs> so well, then, um, yes. So so then, the next day, because you're, you know, you're military. There was a debriefing. Well, next day, uh, you know, we get off work. Uh, I'm, I'm giving a ride to the uh, law enforcement there in uh, Burroughs to Ipswich. He lives down there, too, not far from me, per his flight chief's request, uh, so he could get to work on time and stuff like that. And um, he says, I said, we, he says, let's go back out there. So I don't want to go back out there. This is right at the, the morning after. And uh, uh-huh. He, he was persistent, so I said, okay, okay, we'll do that. And so I said, I got a couple things to do, so I had to go by the photo lab, had to drop the film off, uh, which I did. And then we went out there, and we're looking around. He hollers at me, he says, look over here. He says, come over here. And uh, that's the area I know, you know, where the landing was. And on the ground, there's these three impressions on the ground. I said, yeah, so see this? And he seemed like surprised that it was there, and which I thought was odd. And um, anyway, uh, I go on home, uh, and uh, I uh, to shorten the story up a little bit. Is I go on home and I, <laughs> uh, I am pretty. Uh, I don't know if the Air Force was gonna. I needed some kind of proof. For me, mm-hmm. after what happened, and so my 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 landlord was like an interior decorator and stuff. So he had something. He said, "I got something that you use to 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 take impressions of that." And I said, "What is it?" And he goes, "Plaster Paris." And he got it all mixed up for me, and I put it in a backpack, and I went back out there, and I went out to the area, and I poured the stuff, and. And I waited for it to dry, and I, at the time I smoked cigarettes, so I was, there was about three cigarettes I think I had, and uh, waited for it to dry. It dried pretty quickly, uh, and I put the stuff back in in my backpack, and I'm going back in, and I run into, uh, you know, the uh, uh, assistant uh, squadron commander and another the day flight chief, and like, a, and, you know, first thing a major jury says to me is, "What are you doing out here?" Oh, I just, uh, you know, I thought I was in trouble. I thought, you know, I, you know, you're not supposed to go out there and take plaster <laughs> pairs. Of so I said, well, I just wanted to see the area again. He said, I, he said, I want you to go home. He said, I want you to take a, you know, enjoy your three-day break. He said, don't worry about it. We got this. I said, okay. Uh, and then, you know, I get back home, and, I, of course, that day I would normally sleep after a midnight shift, but I couldn't sleep that day. And uh, you know, I was trying to do that. I finally get uh, maybe that that night. Um, this is the 26th, the night of the 26th. I finally get uh, uh, to bed, and I still can't sleep. So it's maybe one in the morning on the 27th, I guess. I so I figured I'm going to be up all night. It was just a lot of trauma, and. Um, yeah. Yeah, I was okay. You know, I said, well, eventually I'm going to have to sleep, you know. Uh, so I figured, okay, I'll get up and uh, I'll make a pot of coffee. I'm not going to sleep up, sleep anyway. So I'm sitting at my dining room table down in the Ipswich and I'm drinking a cup of coffee. And then I'm running all this stuff through my head about what happened with, uh, you know, the incident and that. And then I still see these ones and zeros flashing. I said, this is my God, this trauma. I. I don't know. I, it, it's got to stop, or I'm going to have to go to the base hospital. And I know that's not going to end well because I'm no. going to tell them. Yeah, I'm going to have to tell them what happened. Uh, you know, I was out in the forest, and there's a craft unknown origin. And oh my God, and I got ones and zeros in my head. And oh Lord. <laughs> yeah, they. Yeah, well, you're going to lose your weapons card. You're going to lose your oh, security yeah. clearance, and we're going to go ahead and discharge you. Okay, we'll start that. That's probably what would happen. And uh, so I'm looking through the notebook, and I'm looking at all my notes, and I I decided to flip back through all the way back. In the back, I have all kinds of paper. And I said, you know what? I think I can write those ones and zeros down. So 
I uh, start, you know, writing the ones and zeros down, and it was uh, as I did that, I felt better. Mm-hmm. I said, "Oh, anytime I can feel better at this point in time is great." So I just kept writing down. I finished the first page, I think, and you know how it is you got pens in a drawer you know and all of a sudden they freeze up because they don't work you know how that works and so i'm like panicking going through the drawer trying to find a pen that works find another pen that works and i continue writing these down and i wrote i wrote down uh 16 pages in this notebook and um i got to the point where i couldn't see the ones and zeros no more and i felt great so i stopped and i said okay jim this here is a uh, a complete meltdown, you know what I mean, uh, with this mm-hmm. trauma. You, there's no way you can report anything about this. Uh, it's a bad, bad situation for you. And mm-hmm. since you feel good, that means you dodged the bullet. You'll probably be okay. So, And I was tired. Even with a pot of coffee, I was still tired. And uh, so I went to bed finally. And I slept for, I don't know, 10 hours, 15 hours, a long time. And, uh, of course, when I woke up, I felt great. And so, uh-huh. yes, as I, so I said, well, I'll keep the incident, the, the part with these craziness, this mental breakdown to myself. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, I didn't, I didn't share it with nobody. I didn't even share it with my, with my uh, at the time, my wife. And, you know, uh, well, first of all, I wasn't going to share anything with her because when we came home, uh, Burroughs was with me and Burroughs boarded out that, you know, we're, because we looked so bad. He said we were chasing UFOs and they started laughing. And I told him, I said, don't ever ask another question about it, okay? I said, because that's when the ridicule actually started. But here's the mm-hmm. opportunity. My, my wife and Sergeant Kennedy, who was our, our roommate, we had we rented a room out, uh, they, uh, that was a good opportunity to talk to me about it because uh, everything was unclassified then. Mm-hmm. And I could have told, told them anything, uh, anything about it. it didn't, but they sort of blew that. And um, uh, an ex-wife now, by the way. And, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. And um, so that was the, uh, I thought, okay, it's over, it's behind me. No, it's not. So I get a call from Sergeant Hudson. He worked in the orderly room. This is Sunday, so I know he's not in the orderly room, but he, I get a call from him. He says, uh, yeah, you got to report into the OSI building uh, tomorrow morning. And I says, well, the squadron commander wants to see me? He goes, no, he doesn't want to see you. I said, okay. He says, so he gave me the appointment time. And uh, so uh, the next morning I told Burroughs that we had to go in early. And um, by, and I and I knew that uh, uh, oh and then we were also told that we had to go up and brief the command element, uh, the base commander, wing commander, you know about what happened, which that was afterwards. Uh, okay. So uh, OSI first, and I had we had to go up to uh, the uh, base commander's office. So I get an OSI and. It actually went pretty good. The uh, I knew the agents. There's like nine of them that were assigned there. But the people that interviewed me were not from the uh, OSI, uh, but they were in an official capacity of some sort. They wore suits and stuff. Uh, one was British and the other was American. And uh, they said pretty much this, uh, you write everything down and this goes away. You tell us everything. This goes away then. And, you know, that's mm-hmm. exactly what I wanted to happen. And I said, okay. So I sit down and I, you know, the legal pads, I, you know, I'm a terrible writer, so I have to print everything if, to make it legible. Um, so I printed out, it was four pages of the, on this legal pad. And I get I get all finished. They said, okay, we're going to type it up. Uh, they gave me a soda. And they said, it won't take long. I said, okay. Uh, and I'm looking at my watch because I know we got to get up to the base commander's office. And um, anyway, they come back in about 15 minutes. And uh, mind you, I had four pages that I, I wrote up. And they bring back uh, a, one piece of bond paper, 
uh, with a quarter of it single type or single line spacing used up. And I says, uh, here, here's your statement. I'm thinking this thing looks a little bit lean, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, he says, what you want you to do is you want you to read it and you want you to memorize this. I says, why? So well, that's what we want you to do. And I said, okay. So I'm, I go through it. I read it like three or four times, and it's very generic. It says, uh, got one, in, and it was, and you can tell someone British wrote it because it was in meters. Uh, the color, like color, uh, the word color was spelt British way, not the American way. And, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I memorized that. They said, okay, this is what happens. This goes away. It's now an official uh, investigation by us, whoever us is. I suspect NSA uh, because uh, OSI uh, at that point in time uh, overseas worked for the State Department, Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. That's how that's how their structure said they didn't work for any other base, and uh, so that made sense about the other agents there. And this is what you want you to do is uh, if anybody asks about this, uh, this is what you tell them from this point on because it's an active investigation. I says, well, I said I'm I got an appointment to see the base commander, wing commander, and he says no, this is what you tell them. I said okay, you got it. <laughs> and that's that's exactly what it is. I meet up with the other airmen uh, at the uh, over on base, and we go to the base commander's office, and uh, that's exactly what I tell them. Uh, uh, of course, now Burroughs wasn't in there with me, and he's talking about we were right there. It was a triangular craft, and you know, so I said I'll finish the report. I told him to, uh -huh. you know, I, I shut them up. And uh, anyway, they separate us at two ends of the tables to write, write your own stuff. And I said, well, I guess I ain't responsible for him, what he writes. And he, he drew the craft and you know, triangular craft and all that stuff. And uh, we, we gave our reports in. Then I went in and reported to the base uh, wing commander and told him about it, and was, which was really odd. Uh, he was yeah. very uh, – uh, the uh, – well, the base commander was in there, too, and also Colonel Halt, the deputy base commander. And when I reported for us uh, in there to uh, uh, Colonel Williams, um, he never asked one question. He just listened attentively, let me say what I was supposed to tell him from what I was coached on from OSI. And mm -hmm. he just says, okay, gentlemen. He says, gentlemen, he says, thank you very much. He says, I appreciate it. He says, uh We'll go ahead and take it from here. Wow. Yeah, I know. So we well, get out of there, and I'm like, wow, not one question? Like, anything? What? <laughs> what is this? Yeah. And at that so point, it was classified? Uh, yeah, we're told in, uh, in uh, Colonel Halt's office to treat this as top secret. Now you're wondering okay. how I can talk about it. How can I talk about this now? If it was top because secret. it was declassified. I mean, <laughs> and you retired. Um, well, the thing is, when Colonel Halt retired, he retired two years before I did. Uh, uh -huh. In 91, I believe it was. And I retired in 93. So it's top secret all the way up through that. But when he retired, he he actually got a hold of me. He says, hey, when you retire, he says, make sure you ask about this incident and see if it's you know, on our, our NDA, the non-disclosure uh, for classified, you know, uh -huh. and, you know, they have all the other stuff on like nuclear weapons and contingency plans and all this other stuff. But, and I, when I got to retire, go from my retirement, uh, at Grissom air force base, uh, the personnel guys, you know, gives me my NDA to read and I'm going through it, you know, classified plans, this, that, that, that. He says, oh, there's nothing on here about Bentwaters or Woodbridge. He goes, okay. I says, is that classified? And he says, well, we'll find out. So we he typed up a message, and they sent it off to the Pentagon, uh, Headquarters Air Force. And he said, we'll get back with you. He said, I'll let you know, and we can finish the out process. And I said, great. So a couple of days later, uh, he calls me up, so we're ready to do the out process, and I got the message back. I said, great. So I go back up to personnel at Grissom, and uh, he says, I got a really strange response from Headquarters Air Force. I said, you did? He goes, yes. He says, 
nothing classified happens on those dates at the locations <laughs> you were talking about. So therefore, nothing's classified. Well, that's that's cool. Now, now I'm gonna. I, mean, I said, I said, can I have a copy of that? <laughs> that <laughs> yeah, that was it. So that's why I can talk about it. Okay, so I'm gonna stop you here because um, your book goes into further detail. This event did cover three days. There were other incidents, but nothing quite like what you went through. And um, your book does cover it all, but. But yes. I want to focus. I, oh, the book is amazing! It goes in into such detail. Oh, you live do it. Do you like Sergeant Neville's? Sergeant Neville's, uh, Monroe Neville's, uh, the Disaster of Preparedness. He goes into the uh, third night about it, and uh, and and I was just fascinated reading uh, his uh, chapter. Oh, um, yeah, and, fact, no, and, the, everybody's got to get this book. But but the thing is, you've got about. Ten hours you could talk on this, and I want to cover your part of it because yeah, there, after... there's no spoilers here. There's no spoilers of what I'm saying. Believe me, in the book. I mean, I'm not going to oh. spoil the book. Uh, no, 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 no. But but so what happened is that that you know you kind of you know kind of brushed it under the table when anybody asked you. You said, "Nah, nothing happened," and and so, but but clearly something had happened to you because you had. Um, gosh, terrible nightmares. And yeah, um, it was it wasn't so bad when I was in the military, uh, mm-hmm. but but after I I got out, I retired in I don't know, I guess November '93, and um, it was like I started then, and it started slowly progressing where I was having problems sleeping and stuff like that, and. Um, it was it went maybe about eight nine months after I was out. I mean, I was to the point where I was only getting maybe an hour or two maybe sleep a night. I mean, you could only maintain so long with that amount of sleep. I mean, you start you know, it's just crazy, and um, it was affecting you know, my work. I couldn't work. I couldn't keep uh, focus on anything, and so um, I went to my my medical doctor and uh, I said, "Here's my problem. I can't sleep and all the." And she says, well, I don't know. She says, it's just here. The, she ran all kinds of physical stuff, and, and there were no problems. And she says, well, I'd like to do a referral, but I don't know how you're going to take this. And I said, well, what's a referral? Because you know, right now I can, take, I can take anything as long as it makes me sleep, you know. Yeah. And um, she says, well, to a, if I do a referral to a, psycholo- a psychiatrist, I said, that's fine. I said, you got it. Put, give me a put me in contact with her. And he said, well, I think it's, it's emotional. And I was like, yeah, all right. I mean, uh, I really didn't think so. And, um, of course, uh, I get the appointment set up with the uh, uh, psychiatrist. And, uh, you know, uh, we do a, I don't know, two or three maybe meetings uh, like that. Yeah, there, you know, actually it was all right. It was nice to talk to somebody like that. And yeah. um, then she says, I think there's 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 a traumatic event, you know, maybe from your childhood or something that might have caused this. You know, I was thinking, I mean, like uh, uh, somebody messed with you when I was a little kid, and she, well, that's a possibility. I'm like, oh my god, I don't remember anything like that. And uh-huh. no, I had a great, I had a great childhood, you know. And she says, no, I just want, I want to do that. And she says. Um, We'll set up a time, you know, to uh, do this uh, hypnosis. I go, okay. And uh, I'm okay with it. She says uh, she's going to record it and uh, video record it. But that's her notes at the time. Uh, mm-hmm. That's the ass bonding, whatever. That's fine. And she says, you won't remember anything. Uh, everything will be fine. I can make it uh, be no stress for you. And I said, great. So we do a session, which is two hours long about. And when I come out of this, this trance or whatever they put you in, uh, I mean, I feel great. Okay. It, it felt like I had, you know, I was very relaxed and uh-huh. the doctor, the doctor's in front of me and her jaws on the table. And I said, what's the matter? And she goes, we're going to have to do another session. I says, why? <laughs> she says, uh, we need to talk more about Woodbridge. And I went, Oh my God, are you kidding me? 
She says, no, that's where the issue's at. And I went, oh, my God. You know, so I did the other session with her, and, uh, of course, I tell her everything during that. I mean, everything's yeah. there. That, and uh, she gets all done, and she says, uh, I'm going to prescribe you certain kind of medicine, you know, the uh, that will be a, like a, I don't know, it's an alpha blocker or a beta blocker or something like that to help you uh, where you can sleep and maybe not dream. It might help. Uh-huh. And we have to get the get it adjusted. And uh, so uh, we started doing that. And she, she says, do you want these tapes to watch? She says, they're my notes. I've got them. You know, I've recorded everything now. I says, yeah. I said, okay. I says, let me have them. And that would never happen today. I think everybody would be afraid to get sued or something, right? Oh, yeah, uh, I don't think they, I don't, yeah, I don't think they give them your notes. And anyway, she gave them to me, and that's that's uh, something I held on to uh, without wa- watching uh, for uh, until I haven't watched them. Okay, I've never watched them. Uh, I I did like start them and watch about, you know, like 30 seconds or a couple of minutes. And I, if this was too traumatic for me, so I could never make it through them. So, um, so anyway, we're writing this book, Gary. So, tells so what, me, did, but, but what did you learn about it? I mean, you know, you must've, you, you learned something from, from that experience about what had happened to you when you were being debriefed. Well, that's, uh, uh, the debriefing part, I like other people that I had look at it. They, there was uh, apparently at OSI that they did uh, induce uh, drugs to uh, uh, true serum type drugs, uh, and uh, apparently I agreed to it uh, to I, to cover up the part about the binary. Okay, mm-hmm. it, it would there was a block for that, and. That is what the psychologist, the the, the psychiatrist, uh, discovered this block, and she had to work through this block, and she did break the block, uh, and it was very creepy because uh, uh, there was like a, a nursery rhyme that was put in as a safeguard, and it was unusual according to her, and um, anyway, she broke this block, and uh, I would. I, I, then I started talking about it in the second hypnosis uh, mm-hmm. about what happened down OSI. And the whole purpose down there where they tried to make me forget it in block is the fact that we're talking about this binary. And everything else was intact, but it was that mm-hmm. part they didn't want to know. The only problem is with uh, with those folks down there, the agents, is that uh, their Achilles heel uh, was they didn't know that the notebook existed with the binary that I wrote down in it, and um, that was that was it. They didn't know that was like, they know the notebook existed, but they thought it was just my notes from being out there. Um, but with the binary written in there was the full message, and um, uh, that was that was in in, in those uh, in in there. That, of course, I did that night uh, mm-hmm. when I couldn't sleep. Um, you want to go farther into the binary part? Well, I, I think it's important that, um, yeah, I, I. how did it come out that you just thought they were ones and zeros? So how oh, did, yeah. How, yeah, that's really crazy stuff because all these years it was just a bad experience for me in, in a notebook. I, I mean, I, I kept it to myself, put it in the back of the notebook. <coughs> excuse, excuse me. I did that, and uh, so anyway, we're going to do a film shoot. Uh, it was for Ancient Aliens. It was out in Phoenix, and I was going to be there with Linda Moulton Howell and John Burroughs. Anyway, I take a notebook because I'm going to show the glyphs and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, and uh, so I'm down there, and, and we're in the middle of the shoot, and I'm sitting in a chair, and they're together, and they're switching film. They had film at the time. And uh, they're going to switch, reload the film. And so Burroughs asked me about you know, a date or a phone number or something like that. And I said, I don't know. I must have it in here. I'm flipping through the notebook. And I go back too far in the notebook. 
and of course the binary flips open. And um, at that point in time, it was ones and zeros to me. And living alone, yeah. how she goes, oh, she's, what's that? And I said, oh, that's I, I figured, oh, what the hell? I might as well tell them. Uh, you know, this is my mental breakdown time. You know, and. <laughs> At least some years later, what is it? I'm I'm a big boy. I can take it, right? So I said, yeah. uh, "This is this is the binary I wrote down that night when I was home." And they go, "Or the ones and zeros." And she says, "Those aren't just ones and zeros. She says, That's binary code." And then when she said that, it made sense because I did a a book with her oh, back in '95, '96, and uh, she actually heard. The you know the tape she actually had it uh, uh, copied I guess she used part of it in this this book that she wrote and uh, I just thought it was uh, just like ludicrous stuff you know that she wrote and I was actually upset about what she wrote in the book and uh, but anyway it mentions that I could see binary code I didn't know what binary code was until I was in Phoenix and it was like 2013 or something you know. <laughs> uh, it, yeah, or 2000, I don't know what it was, 2010, I think it was. And um, so I made the connection, oh, that's binary. And so that makes sense now because it was in the in the uh, hypnosis. Uh-huh. And uh, then they wanted uh, Linda to say, well, we got to get tested. They said, oh, it's going to be gibberish, I know. It was just, it's just a mental breakdown time. And she says, well, <laughs> I mean, she was pestering me about this. She was, she was terrible. She was relentless, and they both said we gotta, you gotta have it, you know, someone to look at it. Said, okay, let me go home and think about it. Yeah. So I fly back, I fly back to Chicago, and I'm thinking, oh, I don't have to it. In the meantime, Kim Sharon, the producer for Ancient Aliens, calls, calls me, and says, "Hey, we can get this tested for you, uh, you know, confidentially if you want." And uh, uh-huh. and so I said, okay. I said, what? She goes, give me four or five pages or some of it, and we'll take a look at it. So I scan them. I send them to Kim. In the meantime, I got Linda calling me, like, daily, like twice a day or three times a day. I don't know. It was a lot. And she says, I want to get this tested. I got a guy out in Australia that can do it, and then someone in North Carolina. I don't know. I said, okay. So she won. I said, okay. I, I sent her the same scan. They gave to ancient aliens, um, and uh, so then the next day, I get a call from Kim Sharon. She's all excited. She says, uh, "We, you got to go." At that time, we didn't have like the Skype like it is today. We had to go on, and she was on the phone, and then she was showing me stuff as she sent it to me. Uh-huh. She says. Those ones, in, she says, that binary code has a message. And I says, you're kidding me. There's no way. And that's impossible. She says, oh, no, 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 it does. <laughs> so we went through it, and I was just completely blown away by it. And uh, it had uh, <clears throat> a, a definite message uh, on the pages I gave her. And I'm thinking, well, it's got to be a mistake. She says, no way, she says. This guy's an expert on it. And blah, blah, blah. I said, okay, well, let me think about this, okay? And she says, well, I want you to know. I said, okay. She said, well, I think we want to do another show. I said, I don't know. Just give me some time on this. And <clears throat> anyway, Linda calls up the following day, and she's all excited. She says, there was a message in there. I said, okay, what did it say? I'm, I'm, more, I'm, I'm actually uh, more uh, level-headed that day about it, not in shock. And she goes through it. It's exactly what the Kim Sharon's uh, uh, person that deciphered it. The other two professors uh, deciphered exactly the same thing. And I went, "Damn! I went, how can that happen?" I mean, I, I, I still, I still can't understand it today. I, I think it's just the most incredible thing uh, because, uh, well, one is I don't have that type of memory. <laughs> Okay. There's no way, and let alone anything that be coherent or makes sense. There's just no way I could do that. So if that's not enough, um, um, they want to do a show on that, and then I mean I'm going back and forth. They're actually uh, I mean Linda and 
John Burroughs were just all over you. This has to go out. I said, I don't know if it's supposed to go out or not. I, mean, I don't know. It seems like, why would I have this? And should I share it? I don't know. And uh, anyway, they convinced me. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I can only take so much badgering. So I put it out. And, and at the show, we tape it. And we're in England. We're doing a reunion over there. And uh, uh, Prometheus Entertainment, that's who does Ancient Aliens, Kim Sharon, mm-hmm. they uh, they sponsor the, the event, you know, pay for our tickets, all that kind of stuff. And um, we do a, a, uh, a conference over there at Woodbridge. And uh, that's when uh, they actually show us the show that was airing that night. And... <laughs> Uh, you know, I watched the segment. I went, oh, my God. I said, well, that's out now. And, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, okay. Yeah, it wasn't, you know, it's out. Is, is it okay so, to share what what it 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 was uh, translated to? Sure. You, this, there's no spoilers to this book. We can say anything about this book and still you, you got to – I'll tell you what. Were you – were you with me when you were reading chapters three and four? Were you with me in that forest that night, you know, when you were reading it? I mean, that's where you should oh. have been. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Not only that, you know, I could, so to, like I spoke to you earlier, I can relate because I've seen an unidentified flying object, you know, don't know where it came from and don't think it was extraterrestrial, but I truly believe it was unidentified for sure. So yeah, yeah, it, it, it had the same characteristics as uh, the Rendlesham one. Uh, no, yeah, it, I mean, it, it didn't. But, so but we, didn't, his, we didn't have your, sound, right? It didn't. What? Did it have? Did it have, did it have sound? Uh, no sound. No sound at okay. all. It it when it when it took off and it swooped over my dormitory, um, it paused for just a minute. And and I really got to look at it. And then suddenly it was, it was gone. There was no air displacement. There was no sound. There was no sonic boom. There was It was just gone. Right. So, you know, right. that I have experienced, so, and I've experienced the prickling, the, the, um, uh, the, mm-hmm. the static feeling, the, the, the prickling all over. So, so. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna share what I think is the, the binary code suggests. Um, I think we have to leave it for everybody else's. Um, well, that's what know. the whole book is. The book is to give them all the facts and let uh-huh. them come to their own conclusions. But yes, I have no problem. And uh, you want to put your thoughts on it or mine? I don't. I don't. I don't have no problem. Yeah. With that. Um, so, so his binary, your binary code translates to exploration of humanity, continuous for planetary advance, eyes of our eyes, origin year, eight thousand one hundred, and then there are seven, um, there are seven uh, ge- uh, geographic locations, the, the longitude, latitude, what is Carco. Um, Belize, one is Sedona, Arizona, Great Pyramid of uh, Giza, Giza Plateau, I guess. Nazca, the Nazca Lines in Peru, no, I'll mispronounce this, Shandong, Tai Shan, Qi, <laughs> China. Yeah. Uh, Portara, Temple of Apollo in, in Greece, and the last one is High Brazil, which is an island off the coast. Uh, it's, it's underwater now. Um, yeah, yeah but, but High Brazil... That island is now, that's the only coordinates that's mentioned twice in the binary, in the message. Interesting. It's mentioned, yeah, it was, it was mentioned at the beginning, and it's the one at the end. It's the only one that's so, mentioned twice. And this is from Celtic mythology. It's, it's been called the Celtic Atlantis. Now, Atlantis. now um, your, your whole experience and, and, the, and the download of this material you know, assuming it is from 8,000, you know, 6,000 years from now um, or so. Uh, it, it's in one place, um, I think, in one of your hypnosis uh, things, it's, it's kind of like, oh, and the other thing I liked that you came out with a, a comment, which I thought was just phenomenal. First, first of all, 
well, no, the, the the one comment that you came out with in hypnosis was in in 2013. I, um, even in their future, they are us, right? So the, these are supposedly people from the yeah. future coming back. Yeah, the, hip, the hypnosis uh, supports uh, that. Uh, these coordinates. One of the things that we researched for the last eight years uh, with Gary Osborne, he did the main part of the research. He was uh, actually mm-hmm. the research team leader. And um, I'll tell you right now, Gary was a skeptic, uh, and that's the kind of people that should investigate. You know, it's people that uh, oh, only look at yeah. yeah, only look at the facts. They build off the facts, you know, the evidence, and wherever that leads you, it leads you. It might lead you to dead end or whatever. And uh, so. <clears throat> His breakthrough was uh, a few years ago, before, prior to writing the book. Uh, mm-hmm. And this breakthrough he had is uh, because originally I contacted him about this 23 and a half degrees. I thought it was about temperature, and it had to do with the yes. planet. But okay. And uh, anyway, without going through that long story with that, uh, Gary did the, the research along with our research team, which had professors from academia around the world. Uh, you know what's strange thing about professors that work at universities. They don't want their names public because no. of a grant. They yeah. don't. It's like, oh, my gosh. I mean, and, and some do, but a couple of them, like the one in Cambridge doesn't. I know that. And um, anyway, I better not say too much about that. I probably said no. too much in the book. Didn't I? Um, yeah, they'll figure it out. Um, I know. Yeah, I think, I think you were reasonably respectful. I tried to be. <laughs> <laughs> you know, their, their privacy. I tried to do that. And I, you know, a person did. didn't want their main man in there. I, I put their alias in there, an alias. You know, if they didn't want their uh-huh. name in them, I did that stuff too. Uh, yeah. And anyway, the binary. What, what is, we kept getting discovery after discovery. Gary called me up. Wow, wow, wow. You know, this is my reaction. And uh, uh-huh. they started out, but each step was a rung on the ladder. Without having this first step, the second step wouldn't happen. Or the second step, you didn't have that, well, it wouldn't have a third the first, step. Give them the first step then, because be, just so that they understand what you're talking about. Because you got numbers, I think. Um, I well, on a, it, on a global scale, they, uh, uh, I think the first thing that came out from them was the uh, – uh, global on a on a global scale, these coordinate sites started uh, with uh, like the twenty three and a half degrees. Half mm-hmm. of that was another one, and, and they started building on that. They all were connected that way, and uh, the, even though it looks like a list for you know uh, a new age site or something like that. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It really is um, how they were connected. And it kept building on the connections. And the thing is, this this binary uh, on a global scale is down to, in some cases, an inch or two. You know, it's that mm-hmm. precise. So, uh, and it, uh, uh, one of the things that it does put out is it puts uh, the Azores in, uh, in, in, in focus and um, in, in with this. But to make a long telling of this binary um, uh, a little shorter is uh, what it has done uh, on, a, on a global scale. It has uh, suggested that there, uh, through these coordinates, that there must be, without a doubt, according to the math, there has to be a chamber inside the Giza pyramid that's undiscovered right now, but they think they actually discovered something here uh, within the last six months, last seven. Yeah, they, they have. Uh, they have. Well, we had a research team. There's there a couple of research teams were there, but one of us had one of our guys on it. And I think it was the one from Stanford. I'm not sure. And um, anyway, they discovered that there is probably something uh, in this chamber. We need to go back over there. We need to do some ground, ground penetrating radar and, uh, and we, we were pretty sure that there's going to be a, uh, an undiscovered chamber there. You think that was a lot, and uh, would be probably the 
uh, discovery of the lifetime, and when I do believe that chamber will give us evidence that we're looking for. There is an indicator. It's not in that code for no reason. I mean, there's got to be a reason why it's pointing that out. Uh, that's our theory, anyway. <clears throat> but to top that all off, that's that's not even the the, the the major discovery. The major discovery was made in May of 2019, and <clears throat> what that is by the by the uh, uh, increments over uh, 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 digitally, you know, from uh, you know from one tenth on over, you know how how it goes on, yeah. on the code. Uh, normally, uh, and he, Carl Sagan even said this in '77. Normally, uh, if we uh, we operate normally on a you know six digits over, okay, that's where we're usually at, human beings. Uh, and if you found one with seven digits over. That probably mean it came from a really high source, uh, intelligence source, uh, and uh, that's what he was looking for. If, it, if you were going to get a message from a higher intelligence, it would be like seven over. Well, the binary code with with Rendlesham in 1980 wasn't seven digits over; it was 13 or 14 digits over. So whoever devised this, that's proof positive, by the way. This came from a higher intelligence. There's just no doubt about that the, it, because it contains a fine structure constant. And this fine structure constant is stuff that's within, is well known in the whole scientific uh, community. Uh, and it's in a lot of things like uh, black holes and galaxies and all kinds of stuff. And... Uh, Anyway, binary code contains that, uh, and it contains it to that degree. So whatever, you know, we can theorize a lot. I mean, to be 13 or 14 digits over, we can theorize that, what is that, Cat 2 civilization? I don't know. It's a pretty, they're, they're pretty advanced. Um, well, I think what the, the one phrase that, that, that came out that, that, you know, when I hit it, I went, Oh my goodness! Now, now I, I can go along with this one, um, and I think you—I am not sure when. 2013, I think, is when I wrote it down that I found it. I think um, it, it may have been through one of your hypnosis sessions. Um, I don't think it came out of the binary code, but you said in 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 this particular session, even in their future, they still await first contact. Yes, that was and, in 1994. The hypnosis. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And when I when I read that, I thought that makes more sense than anything else that I've seen or heard in decades. And yeah. that yeah. that that to me makes makes such sense that it's you know it, it's kind of, it resonated so so to me that it was like I'll buy that. I'll buy that. Six thousand years from now, we're still waiting for first contact. That makes sense. Now, yeah, you know. it's, it's actually sort of scary, isn't it? In a way, I mean. Uh, well, it puts uh, yeah, things into a. We're not a alone. Perspective. We're not alone, though. You know, we're not really alone. I mean. Oh no! Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> no, I agree with you on that. But but I also feel strongly that that when we're ready to meet other consciousnesses out there we've got to get to a point where we're ready and and we're not we're very primitive so to my well, mind it, you know it it just uh, that that resonated to me so so is is all of the investigation of the binary stuff done or 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 is it an ongoing process it's an ongoing process and uh what we're going to have to do is uh, we're, I'm planning on taking some of the proceeds from this book to fund, uh, you know, a uh, actual site visit and stuff like that. We got to do that stuff. Uh, yeah, uh, it's this is going to take a little while, but this, I think we're only at the on the ladder of maybe rung of a 50 rung ladder. We're probably on rung number 12. Okay, we. There's a lot more we think that uh, uh, to this. We just keep getting discoveries all the time. Uh, well, 
you know, I think I, things things always, t- in my mind, happen when they're supposed to. And for a great length of time, the um, military put out a lot of information that, that, you know, was meant to make people think that it, it, it there was a hoax or it was, you know, little green men running around sure. or, mm-hmm. you know, they, they did everything they could to mask the seriousness of this. And, and, of course, they didn't know about the binary code. And you do wonder if they had known about it, could they have taken it from you and hidden it and it never would have been been out? It would never have been out. I'm sure, well, it wouldn't have been out. It wouldn't have been out and it's uh, put out by us. I mean, we put it out. Um one of the things you mentioned, uh, yeah, the, how advanced they are and about the consciousness. Uh, I think I, that is the communication process that I had. I don't think information ran up my arm uh, no. from contact. Okay. It had to do with the technology I cannot explain that seems like light. And, but it, I think consciousness is tied to it. I think it was a basic form of it, uh, that communication for me. And uh, uh, maybe that's what we evolved with. Maybe, uh, you know, we have all kinds of theories on it. I mean, uh, and this is not to uh, uh, discredit people that have experiences. Uh, I value each person's UFO experience or uh, either, you know, they're, they're, it's explainable and they just don't know it or else it's Unknown. I mean, it's going to be. There's not a lot of answers there, uh, but uh, it. It. I don't believe in the alien hy- hypothesis at all now. Not after the what we found in the code and stuff like that. Besides, even the even the the craft of unknown origin, it it was triangular. It had a dorsal fin like our aircraft has. Uh, it uh, it. Why mark it? Why mark it with symbols? Why do that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's what we do. Well, it well maybe been like we a tag it. like made in Japan, you know. I mean, yeah, it yeah, I, been... know. <laughs> I mean, there's just things that the, the, that only humans do right now that we know of, and mm-hmm. uh, it just uh, it, it all makes sense. Every type of uh, uh, discovery that is made with this, it just reinforces that it's not the alien hypothesis. No, it's not no, that. I, not I, you, there, there's other. There's other great. Uh, I say you know uh, Jack. I don't want to mess up his last name. Jack Safardi. Uh, uh, name's familiar, he's, but no, yeah, he's a, he's a ther. Well, he's a theoretical uh, scientist, and mm-hmm. I mean, uh, matter of fact, he used to work with uh, guys out of Stanford with SR, SRI. And back in 69, 68, 70, you know, remote viewing, all that kind of stuff. And they worked under contract with the CIA and that. And some of the other people was like Kit Green and and those are the type of people he worked with. And Put Off and those guys. But anyway, um, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Safari, he uh, believes that this is correct. The The alien hypothesis is not, in fact, a factor with these sightings. It's us from the future. He has come out publicly and said that too, along with a whole lot of other scientists. So well, that's, that's uh, basically it, where I am at this moment in time too. Oh, are you? Um, oh gosh, yeah. Okay, in the book, if I may ask you this, uh, we didn't try to convince you. We just wanted them to inform you with the information we knew, and we, so we didn't try to sway you. We want you to come up with your own conclusions at the end. So hopefully we we achieved that. Well, uh, I've been in this field for 50 years and mm-hmm. um, it's the first time that I felt comfortable with seeing something in writing that I could totally endorse. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, maybe because it's the truth. <laughs> Could be, could be. I, I, you know, you're you're gonna run into a lot of people thinking, you know, or, or people like to sensationalize. People like to throw mm-hmm. fear at people, and and um, as you know, the more the more I read, and the more I realized what you know what I thought was going on, and then you confirmed it, was that I've I've always believed that 
um, people who actually saw these unidentified flying objects and, and had a closer contact with them, there was a consciousness connection to them. And right. your, your, your airman, Fred Burroughs, um, when, when you, you, you know, he had no real, real recollection of a lot of the stuff that went on. He, he, don't, he don't remember anything. Um, well, that's because I don't think he was he was at a level of con. It doesn't mean he's stupid, uh, you know. And level of consciousness well, has nothing saying, to do well, with I'm intellect. Saying, but but uh, but there is a level of consciousness that will be able to embrace a thought, or if they can't embrace it, then they just don't see it or hear it. Uh, and I think I think that's where he was. Um, when when I had when I. When I saw the, the UFO when I was in college in the 60s, um, I was standing in a large group of girls because we were in the dorm, and there were a lot of there were a lot of the girls that that you know ran and hid in closets and were screaming hysterically. There were some that were looking at the same place I was and didn't see what I saw, and you know it, it was sort of like, okay, I was ready. I thought this is great. This, there's something out there. There's something more. You know, we got to stretch and find out what it is. And others didn't see anything. And they were standing right next to me. And this thing blinked out you, the sky. You know, but I think that's common with mass sightings. Uh, and that's what we're talking about, more than one person. I mean, yeah. Bentwaters, Waters, so Woodbridge, uh, that, that was by, you know, 80, 90 people. I mean, not, I don't know how many civilians. Uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's something it's a common factor with mass sightings and uh yeah a person right next to you i i had a uh an account and i can't use their names because i i, I don't want to they could it's up to them to tell their story uh but it was about in northern wisconsin and uh this is the one that we had the uh orb that was confirmed uh unknown because i ran it through the labs and stuff like that uh-huh. anyway the same guy i'm going to try not to use his name <laughs> Uh, this guy, uh, he told me of a, a situation while he was on a dock up there, and he was with another person, and uh, a, a sighting of one of these orbs. Uh, this happened to be an orb. And uh, the other person had a totally different accounting of what happened. It was more mm-hmm. benign. I mean, and it, he says it happens a, a lot, and I, 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 I believe him. Uh, he's a very credible person. Uh, there's also another. Uh, let's talk about a couple of scientific things uh, that are going on sure. here. One of the things that's not mentioned, I don't even think I mentioned in the book, uh, is uh, uh, there's some type of uh, you know, because everything uh, just because there's certain things I just don't believe. I mean, uh, uh, but there's some things that have tie-ins to stuff that. Uh, like for example, um, this this person I know that's up in Canada is doing research on um, um, triangular craft. Okay, and anytime there's over an area, he goes out there, he checks the ground, and I, and they leave this vortex that's underneath these craft and the power unit or whatever it is technology leaves a leaves a leaves a uh, a type of signature in the ground, okay? Yeah. Uh, okay. And uh, the signature under these triangular craft is also the same type of vortex that's in certain authenticated crop circles. Right. So um, there's a connection. Hmm. There's a team right now in Belgium uh, working this, and we're going to get together next year, hopefully, and go over to uh, Wilshire, uh, England, and uh, I, and maybe yeah. do a little research on this. Um, I've had. And I'm not I, talking I've about. Had, the, you know, I'm not talking about the guys with a board and rope and the ones that no, are no, no, faking. No. <laughs> um, I I had the the um, honor of uh, being able to go into a crop circle, and um, a lot of your sensations that you're talking about are the mm-hmm. same that you get in a crop circle. And I did a, a documentary with my late husband on the uh, stone chambers that are all over the northeast here. And when you go into those chambers, you get the same feeling, you get the prickling, you sound is gone. Yeah. 
you know, cars can be going by outside and there mm-hmm. is no sound. So that so that there is an energetic that is connected to some of these occurrences that come from the same place. I guess yes. that's the best way to put it. Really cool stuff. There, yeah, and you know what? And then this also wraps its arms around the uh, us from the future stuff. It just ties mm-hmm. us so so good. And he, you know, we even theorized other things, and we came up with some really good theories on stuff like people to see, uh, you know, these grays or these uh, entities like that or something like. What, what happens if uh, uh, in the future you uh, the corporeal time travel is impossible, interdimensional travel? Maybe it's impossible as far as the human being uh, structurally can, you know, can survive it. Maybe you can't. So what they do is they send back drones, they, uh, uh, or maybe uh, robots that are, you know, a human entity derivative of some kind. You know what I mean? Uh, something that could uh, able to uh, deal with the uh, uh, the structure of interdimensional travel. Uh, you know, who knows? There's all kinds well, of they- theories that you throw out. There's a lot of research on, on telepathy with the thought that, you know, if you can get to a certain point in time, you can either astral travel or you can send a message over, over, over space. I don't know that they've, they've really, they, they probably are working on time as well, but that it, it makes great sense to me with um, things like remote viewing where it's your astral body, it's your, your non-corporeal body that is doing the traveling and seeing things and expressing things. So at this point in time where we can do the astral travel, it's, it's not a huge leap that in the next 6,000 years, maybe we don't need a physical body as much as we do now. I, I agree maybe. with you. I think it's a good theory. It is. So, yeah, no, I, I think it, it well, opens the door to a lot. Well, that's one of the reasons, i tell you what, I know I'm, I know I'm going to be presenting uh, out there at uh, uh, the uh, Laughlin event in, uh, November 1st, but Visions of the Future. But here's the thing. It, it's talking about UFOs, remote viewing, and ESP, right? And I tell you what, mm-hmm. there's people there I want to meet. I mean, of course, I want to meet uh, uh, one of the guys I – did my first book with uh, Nick Pope's going to be there, and I, you know, and Grant Cameron. But one of the mm-hmm. people that I risk dying to listen to because I loved his his, uh, his uh, documentary, but I was uh, Russell Targ. Uh, yeah. I'm looking for. Oh, I'm looking forward to that. And uh, yeah, there's certain people out there I just want to meet, and I want to talk about certain things with them. <laughs> It, it's well, about the event, you know, and to see the, even if there's a, any type of relationship with some of this stuff. Uh, well, this is there. I noticed that. It, I I just let me put out another. I I want to make sure that Paula gets her 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 uh, promos in here. Uh, it's an amazing conference. It's called Star War, Star Works USA Conference at in Laughlin, Nevada, November first through the third. She throws an amazing conference, and the number of guests she has, um, you know, uh, several of the, well, at least Michael Carter, I think, is going to be there, and he's been on the show a number of times. I know. I can't uh, wait to meet him. I'm serious. I want oh, to talk to that guy. Oh. He will, rem- he will, he will remember me. Um, the very first time I had him on my show, I had read his, his first book, and in it I was kind of tickled that, you know, he, he thanked some of the predecessors that had, you know, kind of uh, broken through and, and, and paved the way, and one of them was Patrick Cook, and mm-hmm. that was that's my late husband. And so yeah. um, Michael Michael asked me if I knew anything about UFOs in the Bible, and I said a little bit, and he, he said, well, maybe I should give you an education. I said, I think I'm okay. And he said, no, it's complicated. And I said, y- you know, you, you thank Patrick Cook, and he said, oh, yeah, m- amazing. And I said, well, he's my late husband. And Michael then backed off and said, maybe you could tell me a little bit. <laughs> I, he said, I doubt it. But so he's been on the show a number of times. Yeah, no, he's um, Yeah, I he's can't wait to talk friend. to him. I, I tell you, ideally, I'd like to have a lunch with him or something like that. There's just so many things I want to talk about uh, uh, that uh, because I, I followed his work a little bit, you know, reading to mm-hmm. – uh, there's, there's, no, the list is uh, – 
is uh, it's a crazy list of uh, just great people. I mean, uh, absolutely. Yeah, I know. I and, can't. I can't wait. Are you to, going? To hear, are you going by no, grants or not? Oh. Not this year. Not this year. I, you know, I'm in the middle of trying to move. So, um, but oh. but because I've done I've done a lot of work with remote viewing. So, um, it's it's really kind of interesting. You know the way she's you know got her topics going here. I, I'm drooling. I would love to go. She invited me last year, the year before, and I just couldn't make it. So um, my day will come. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, no, she's she has amazing people that she brings in, and um, the conference is phenomenal. So anybody interested, um, do check out the Starworks USA conference because. Um, it's going to be phenomenal, and and you know if, if you want to see if you want to take a look at this guy, he'll be there, and you can probably pepper him with questions till the cows come home. It feels I like, know you that's know, what I, you know what, that's why I go to those. You know that's why I do a conference. I tell you what's my favorite part uh, is the uh, Q and A because I do run into people that there's certain things about Reynolds from even though even I got this book out. There's certain things I never put out public, and mm-hmm. when I when I hear during the question and answer it, a person talk about their experience, and I hear I hear something that's related, uh, I I always tell them oh, we need to talk after the Q and A, you know, and that's <laughs> what I go there for. No, that's what I go there for, and uh, that's what's really rewarding for me is uh, is to find out there's other there's other people that have had this contact. I mean, obviously I'm not the only one. I mean. Uh, and I think you're the only important. one that got binary code for sure. Uh yeah, I, uh, so far I don't, don't know. You know, I have a lot of people try to hoax it, and what they don't understand in the binary, it, there's a signature in the binary. I believe the way I don't, I'm not a binary person, but somehow there's a signature, and they can tell if it's from the same source. Okay, mm-hmm. and. Uh, uh, I had like eight people send me stuff, you know, and I sent it off to the people to look at, and they go, no, 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 no. So at least uh, whatever they're sending me is not from the source that I had. So uh, I know that much. I think that's, I that's great because I know that that when you have something that that's pure like this, lots of people want to hop on and make it, you know, their thing and and – it's not so much their thing as though you know they they want to they want to put their message out and um if you can you know catch them that way then then you can keep the purity there i mean i think just that this information is out there for now is probably the mm-hmm. most important thing and you know so many people want to take control and be um the only source and be you know the one that the channels Inspiration from the gods, and you know, I know it's just like really... with consciousness. Even I, I think that's something that that's either left in us or <clears throat> given to us in our DNA or whatever. Yeah, I don't, I don't think you can just sit there and learn it. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I, don't. I, I, I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> or else go out there and pay. You know, you have to pay two thousand dollars to have a. To have a, a multiple event uh, with consciousness, I don't think you have to do that. I, I think don't think you can do that. It's either something no. that's very natural. Um, you can probably fake it, and there are probably some good fakers out there. But I think that that personally, I believe, and it's my belief. It's not written in a book any place, but but there there is just a certain portal that some people can get to, and some people can't, and. Um, it can't be taught. It can't be learned. It either is or it is not. It doesn't mean you're not smart or intelligent or wise or wonderful or any of the above. But it, it means that that you know you can bring material through and put it out there and let let uh, let the experts take it and go with it. But what I, what I love is you prevented the government from getting this binary code. You put it out in the general public where it belongs. Uh, yeah. I tell you what, uh, I was told a long time ago, uh, go public with everything you know. It's the safest place to be. And yeah. uh, that's, that's exactly the way, way we, we thought about it. Uh, uh, yeah, safety is in, in making it public, yes. Uh, so, yeah, and 
it's about time that there was full disclosure. I hate using that word uh, with Rendlesham, but it's, we was, we wanted to correct it. There's just so many opportunists out there, and and, and you know and these lecture speakers, uh, on the circuit well, speakers, you know, oh, there's all hearsay what they're saying. Oh my God! If if you had done this 20 years ago, it wouldn't uh, have been taken as seriously as it will be taken today. And, and, you know, there's a very small part of the public, but it's getting bigger every day, that is that is comfortable with saying, okay, all of that is not other entities or other planetary systems or, or um, you know, the, the the Orion's Belt people or, or the Syrian people. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's, it's, it's not them, it's us. And it's us giving us information. You know, when when we send out um, when we send out rockets into the in, in, into the into space and stuff like that, we put stuff in binary code. So yes. it, it it makes sense that binary code comes back to us. It makes perfect sense. Um. Yeah, you know, and all this stuff is is definitely all human, you know. I mean, <laughs> it's um, the thing is, we 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 sat there, and, you know, uh, Gary and I over, uh, you know, a couple of beers or something like that. We sat there and we talk about the what ifs, and you know, some of the things we question is, okay, they're not doing this for us, though, are they? No, they're doing it for themselves. Why, you know? It's it's yeah. got to be. We're humans. We're always going to be with this human behavior. We're always going to be doing stuff for ourselves, somewhere down the line. That's what we're saying. So, uh, but maybe maybe uh, there, there's some there's some gray areas and some doom areas uh, you know that we talk about too, and uh, some of the things uh, you know maybe maybe they just want to create in our timeline. I don't know. Uh, who, well, when who you knows? Can, when you when you consider that the Earth itself has been through at least five what they call mass extinctions, but we're not total mass extinctions, which means that <clears throat> humanity has come back, has has grown and then get, gotten shoved back to square one and then grown and gotten back put back to square one. And I think we always seem to come out better. So you, it would only... It would only stand to reason that, that you know, 6,000 years in the future, that the planet has probably cleaned itself and started again a couple times, too. It, it doesn't make sense to me that it wouldn't. I mean, some uh, of the mass extinctions have been meteors and stuff like that. But um, it, it makes great sense that, that there's, there's always the DNA that keeps coming back because our DNA goes back mm-hmm. millions of years. So, so it's going to be interesting. Well, I agree. You know? I agree. I agree. I fully agree with you. You know, and it, it, it you know, maybe there is a mass uh, extinction event going to happen. Probably, who knows? But you know, I think we have more realistic things <coughs> to worry about. Maybe nuclear okay. war. That that's not off the table. I'll tell you that. As a matter of fact, it's more real than ever. Uh, mm-hmm. But something like that would pretty much devastate the planet. I mean, a full nuclear exchange or something. And uh, well, who knows? Maybe maybe that's in the future. Maybe that's why they're, why high Brazil is such a... Uh, well, I, I think I find it very comforting that 6,000 years from now, someone or a consciousness uh, traveled back this far. To to give us information of some sort. So we think um, they went back we, farther. We we think they went back farther than us. We think they. Uh, the, the, we think that in that that hidden chamber in in the uh, in in Giza. Uh, uh-huh. I mean, we think that there's maybe there's something for information in there that we have to know. We need to know. I don't know. Uh, there, there seems to be a purpose. Uh, that's much bigger than it's just like okay, Rendlesham is not about no person. It's not a, this is my belief. It's not about yeah. me. It's not about anybody. But it's about this binary. If anything else, I, we think that's the whole purpose of of Rendlesham, and uh, uh, we think that's the way it's playing out too. And it all seems to, to be by design. It doesn't seem to be happenstance. I mean, it seems to be oh. all by design. So. 
Uh, that's some well, of the I things that it, we're looking at. I find it fascinating that it was by a government base. A military person got the code and didn't think it important enough to share and saved it so that it could be made public in the future. I mean, come on. You, you, you know, I mean, you kept this thing for 20 years before anything really started to happen. That's impressive. Yeah. Well, I no, I just thought it was an embarrassment. Uh, it was a bad time in my life. That's what I thought. Uh, I don't, you know, it's like, yeah, that's the time I had a mental breakdown. I'm going to talk about it. Okay. <laughs> it just well, sounds, well, you know, I mean, you, yeah. Uh, if you really and, and, have you a know, mental breakdown, you don't know it. So, um, I, I, you know. I, I guess so. I guess you're right. Um but, you know, at the time, it all seemed very real to me, like, oh, my God. You know? and, then, and then I thought my my career was ending, too. That, that was, uh... But I'll tell you what, the Air Force treated me right. I mean, uh, they gave me my lifeline, which I talk about in uh, uh-huh. in the book. and uh, So I wasn't alone. Oh, yeah. Uh, even no, though I is... could talk about it, I wasn't alone. So No. And, and you know, I think it's fascinating, the... the... I mean, your book goes into the whole evolution of, of, you know, coming out of the closet, so to speak, and and sharing your information and 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 the hits and misses along the way. I the book is so meticulously um, footnoted; it's unbelievable, and and it's it's fascinating. Um, it's absolutely fascinating. Uh, it, it's it took me a week to read it. And I only read your part. I haven't gone back and read all the, all the footnote stuff, which is which appears to be fascinating as well. Um, but but I think that that between you and and your co-author, you have put together a document, a big document, um, that that absolutely attests to the truthfulness of what it is you're putting out there. Well, we wanted it to be a historical document. We wanted it to be a history book. We wanted it to be a, a use as reference and stuff like that. Uh-huh. And the best, the best why we have so many, uh, Gary was adamant about the uh, uh, end notes. I mean, okay, we got to, you know, some of them are five levels, seven levels deep. I mean, um, but the, they're oh, required. Yeah. I mean, so you, we, people do, deserve to know what happened. And, uh, and believe me, there's been so much disinformation about the whole account. I mean, People that weren't involved, that wish they were involved, people that uh-huh. hoaxed 30 years of involvement and got caught out. Uh, I mean, all kinds of things. But just keep in mind that uh, uh, you know, everything about uh, eyewitnesses, I mean, they can vary a little bit. I mean, because you know how uh-huh. it is with eyewitnesses. You know, wearing a red shirt, wearing a blue shirt, wearing a green shirt, wasn't wearing a shirt, you know. Um, yeah. All that. Yeah, it's all different like that. But one of the things I, could, I always felt guilty about. I, 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 what I did to, to make it uh, uh, to live with this a little bit better when I was uh, doing conferences or writing, you know, this is the second book, but the first book wasn't very good, but uh, it was it missed a lot. Uh, it was but writing start. books and doing and you know, getting honorariums and uh, all that stuff, I've given all mine so far to date to uh, charity, and. Uh, I feel better by that. I don't, I'm not saying I'm a saint or anything like that, but I feel better not making anything off of the story uh, uh-huh. or the accounting. And I think that's the way it was supposed to be. And uh, I think it's the right way to do it. Uh, this book here, we're going to use the proceeds. Uh, I am my portion to finance one of the uh, uh, visits to one of the, to uh, uh, Egypt would be the first uh, coordinate site. Uh, I've already been to Sedona twice, and that is incredible. I'll tell you, there is, uh, with the exception maybe of Sedona, and uh, uh, it might be possibly there. I know some researchers said there is a type of pyramid there, but I don't. I have never seen it. But all the rest of the places uh, uh, have some type of tie into pyramids. I mean, this uh-huh. is not by chance. Uh, even the one in China, it sits on a you know, uh, next to yeah. a pyramid. Um, uh, the same with Central America. Uh, the one in uh, uh, Nazca, no, but uh, 
what's interesting, if you look at the lines, it draws a pyramid. Mm-hmm. Which yeah, is, it's, it's, it's fascinating. And, and pyramids are, you know, uh, at least in Giza, they weren't meant to be uh, tombs. They were meant to be something else, and we're still trying to figure it out, I'm afraid. Or glad. Maybe the glad. maybe the whole purpose is to, uh, to have some way that a, a physical uh, uh, message can be left from you know five thousand years ago. Besides, we think the pyramids are a lot older. Our researchers that are doing stuff think that they're a lot older too. So, and oh, I would uh, agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, you know, to have a a technology that. Uh, could build something like that uh, is would be hard pressed even today. So, well, it, impossible, I think, so far. I didn't but, want to but, say but, possible, but yeah. <laughs> I well, think... I, I, per- I, I personally think that the, that the pyramids, at least in Egypt, were uh, prior, were 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 constructed before a mass a mass extinction, and that you know. They just happened to be here when we decided to evolve again, and um, you know people are taking credit for it. But but that's just gonna, my personal opinion. You're gonna love book two. <laughs> I'm sure I am. Um, book two, we put the series in there. Yeah. We we are getting real close, so I, I want to give out your website, which is. Let me find uh, it here. Rent- it's www.therendlshamforestincident.com. Right. And for for Paula, um, Starworks USA Conference at Laughlin, Nevada, November 1st through 3rd. Um, and I would imagine that, that, that if you can't make it to the, to the conference, that there will be uh, CDs that, that will be available that you might be able to pick up um, mm-hmm. from the website mm-hmm. afterwards. Don't know for sure. But but um, I, I would imagine but, that's true. Yeah. But I want to thank you so much. I just I so okay. appreciate you one taking final, the time. One final plug. One final plug. Reynolds and Enigma book. It's uh, available on Amazon.com. It's also on Kindle. Uh, uh, please uh, pick up a copy or a Kindle version of it. And uh, I really want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to be able to talk about this. Uh, you know, in this forum. I appreciate it. Oh. It's it's totally my pleasure. I I I think you know I'm gonna have to have you back, and uh, certainly when we get into the second book, we'll have to definitely do one on that. But um, other than that, I do thank you so much. I know that that this is going to be enjoyed by so many people, and you know the more you get out there, the more you spread the information, the more maybe people will stop looking for little green men under their beds and start thinking about the future, <laughs> which I think is more important. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. I agree. Good night. Thank you. Good night now. And everybody, thank you for being here. I so appreciate you sharing your time with us. Um, this has been, for me, an amazing show. Mm-hmm. And I certainly am, am so honored that, that Jim shared his time and his energy and his philosophy and his information with us. Good show to not tomorrow night and then next week, of course, again, Monday and Tuesday. So please. Stay tuned. Visit the YouTube channel when you get a chance. If you like what you hear, subscribe. That said, good night, everybody.